Tattva Talata seminars. Uh, I've started with the slides all ready to go, so hopefully um, you'll be able to follow through with us. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the civil side of Talata cases, and Hannah's going to be giving a more family law perspective, although we both appreciate that they do uh, overlap quite significantly. Um, you'll know that there's uh, some people still joining and you will be hearing uh, an audible beeping sound and hopefully that will um, stop in just a minute or two uh, while we let the latecomers in. But I'm going to start because I appreciate we've only got an hour. You can also turn off your notifications on the lobby if the sound is becoming uh, quite irritating. Um, so I'm going to, I've headed my section, beneficial interest and equitable accounting, but that really just covers everything. Um, I'm going to be talking about two uh, very recent cases um, from 2021, in essence, um, to help with trying to figure out what will ultimately happen in your case. Uh, one of those is Ralph and Ralph, um, and the other one is uh, Roland and Blades. So I'm going to start off with just um, an overview of how courts do establish the beneficial interest when there's a dispute. Uh, so what we've got is we've got three kind of major factors that I will always look at straight away. First one, whether there's a declaration of trust. So is there a TR1 or is there some other signed, written declaration from the parties as to how they intend to um, beneficially own the property? Now, that is the best evidence that you have. Very difficult to overturn. I've listed um, how you can challenge it, and that's fraud or undue influence being one of the first um, provisions. But undue influence isn't simply, oh, I didn't want to enter into it. It really is a high threshold. And I think um, a lot of people, certainly lay clients, misuse that term undue influence just because they often say, well, I, I didn't want to sign it and I signed it anyway. Um, it really is a high threshold and very few reported cases on it. Um, again, mistake. Uh, a lot of um, lay clients will try and rely on that one to overturn a declaration of trust. But it really has to be a common mistake such as um, that the, neither party understood what they were signing especially when you come to that tick box exercise in the TR1. And for mistake to succeed, you really need both parties to agree. And I'm going to come on to that because that was what was um, argued in Ralph and Ralph. There is then an overlap with proprietary estoppel because a declaration of trust um, can be overturned if there was detrimental reliance on an assurance made after the declaration of trust. But that is, that is really a huge area that I'm not going to go into today. So, um, if you don't have a declaration of trust, then I will look at the title deeds. Um, now, again, my experience is that courts will often say, certainly at an early neutral evaluation stage, that um, you know wh whoever's on the title, that's a high burden for the person challenging it to overcome. And um, certainly when you're looking at sole name cases for the other person, to be able to get themselves a beneficial interest. It is a high burden. And what we come down to is this um, common intention and that can triumph over title deeds. And I've seen it much more readily happen um, in recent cases. So I'm gonna go on to discuss a few of those. Um, Ralph and Ralph 2021 was, was a rather unusual case because there was some agreement between the two parties. It was a, a father and son case and it was accepted by both that the son had only gone on the title in order to assist with the purchase um, his father didn't have the income uh, to get on the mortgage and so to assist with that the son uh, who was the eldest of five agreed to assist his father um, unusually here the tr1 box 10 had been completed by the solicitor um, the parties um, themselves hadn't signed it, but the transferor, that the vendor, had signed it. And it was held that that actually satisfied the requirements of Section 53 of the Law of Property Act because it was signed, it was in writing. And so that will certainly assist those seeking to rely on a TR1. But then what we had was that this box 10 had been completed by the solicitor on the basis of his instructions, um, but neither party understood that that box had been ticked. The father's position was that he was 100% beneficial owner and the son's position was rather more woolly. He said, well, 
I never expected to get 50 percent, but I didn't expect to get nothing. Um, and the court said it was significant that he had had a mortgage liability for all those years. And he had, in fact, had not been able to get a mortgage on his own property as a result. Um, at first instance, the father argued for rectification of uh, the TR1, saying it didn't reflect either party's intention. Uh, and that was um, allowed uh, on appeal. The Court of Appeal felt rather differently. And they said then that they couldn't rectify a document where neither party had a common intention. Otherwise, there was no common intention. And so the um, rectification was refused and it left the parties with the 50 50 tenants in common box having been ticked but not necessarily reflecting their common intention. And so there wasn't really a solution. And the court said, well, this really should have been mediated. And I hope that um, the parties can come to some resolution. So um, one can assume that that has happened. There's been no commentary to the contrary that there's an outstanding uh, appeal. So that's certainly one to look at. It's, it's a fairly brief judgment, um, but it does deal with a, a couple of quite useful issues that come up. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about the title deed. And um, as I've indicated here, we had father and son uh, on the title deed. But it really you have you have to look behind that. Um, one of my recent cases, uh, there was a, it was a sole name case. Uh, the father again, father and, and daughter in that case. And the father was um, the sole owner on the legal title. He had put in all of the purchase money, um, but he and his daughter were both on the mortgage. And it was agreed that his daughter was going to pay the mortgage, which she did for some 20 years. Um, parties fell out and father said he wanted his house back and that he would give credit um, for the mortgage payments. Um, at early neutral evaluation, uh, we got a very clear indication that the uh, title would trump all else. It was a it was a very strong presumption and there was no reason to suppose that the daughter was going to overcome it. At trial, um, father gave a very poor account of what he remembered from 20 years prior, and he used words such as guarantor when talking about his intention to be on the title. And the court ultimately found after three days that his intention was never that he was going to be a beneficial owner and that he was only there as a mortgagor to facilitate uh, the purchase. And he got nothing out of that property. Um, despite having put the money in. There were arguments about the presumption of advancement and the court said if they were not minded to go down the constructive trust common intention route, they would have been persuaded by a presumption of advancement argument. So again, really something to be careful about when clients believe that the title is going to be their, their, their trump card. It really is um, a case of common intention prevailing over, over title deed. Um, so common intention, again, uh, just talked about it a bit there. Um, sometimes there's an excuse for one party not being on the title. So, again, th there's cases uh, about false excuse, uh, about um, one party fobbing the other off, saying, well, I would put you on the title, but for the fact that I've got a, 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 a financial um, commitment coming up and I'll put you on the title later. What you really have to look at there is whether there was any reliance by the other party to their detriment upon that assurance. So, again, the overlap with proprietary estoppel. Um, the great thing about proprietary estoppel is it can be more flexible. So, for example, if a person was found to have made an assurance such as, well, this will be your home for life and you'll have a safe place here to live, um, that can be remedied in proprietary estoppel um, much more flexibly than it can with a constructive trust, because there, it's beneficial interest or not. Uh, proprietary estoppel, um, you can award damages for the detriment. Um, I've put in there one case which was quite interesting on title, um, which was Wood and Watkins from 2019. It was a trustee in bankruptcy case. Um, the father had bought a property, paid for everything, mortgage, um, initial outlay, on the title and his daughter had lived there um, for a number of years. In fact, there were several properties, but one in particular took up a lot of the court's uh, time. And um, the court found, despite the father sadly having passed away, uh, that it was 100 uh, percent beneficial interest to his daughter. And that was because of the common intention. Um, father was very wealthy. 
he had paid for all of his daughter's outgoings. He paid for her credit card. Um, she was completely dependent upon him and to suggest that he hadn't intended this property, uh, which she lived in and rented rooms out in, uh, was not 100 percent beneficially interested to her, um, made a nonsense of the common intention. So, again, that's a useful one for if you're trying to uh, overcome the hurdle as to who is on the title. Um, equitable accounting. This uh, is probably um, what takes up the most of court's time at the moment on these cases. Quite often parties will come to an agreement about beneficial interest and there is this, this awful dispute about um, compensation and equitable accounting. And so I, I really want to um, deal with this um, in some detail because I do get asked a lot of questions um, about it. I would say most commonly occupation rent. So I'm going to try and um, talk you through what I think the most important principles are. Um, Stack and Dowden is still, um, all these years later, a really useful starting point. It does um, give a really good overview of the principles. Uh, here I've just um, quoted from paragraph 33 that the starting point is that the court are not going to accept that joint legal owners um, keep some kind of balance sheet to each other because that that again when parties fall out they do seem to think that they can go back uh, you know years before they broke up to say well I paid for more all those years or I paid for the extension I should get that money back uh, and it just it, it, it doesn't happen I'm afraid we really uh, Wilcox and Tate again from 2006 uh, reminded parties that the starting point is that uh, the equitable accounting is from the date of separation. There are exceptions to that, of course, um, common intention being the most obvious one, that if it wasn't intended uh, that parties were going to share or if there was some agreement, then of course you can go back. Um, but, but absent that, you really do need to look at uh, the date of separation. Also need to consider the risk that a court will turn around and say that uh, an account is not proportionate to the issues. Now, that's why it really has to be pleaded at the outset with evidence put in. Uh, Lasca and Lasca is a really good case for um, an investment property. So in that one, there was there was a, a relationship of sorts, but the property was only uh, ever intended to be an investment. And so whatever was put in ultimately were the shares that came out. And in those circumstances where the court is looking at how much money was put in, it's not often proportionate to then do another accounting exercise. It's most commonly where there is a long period of separation before the property is sold and before um, the dispute uh, is settled. So I've just summarised the three uh, issues that come up, occupation, rent, mortgage payments and then property improvement and repairs. Occupation, rent. Uh, this is... Uh, Murphy and Gooch is, is DJ Lightman's case and um, a lot of his judgment is cited by the Court of Appeal. It, it's a really good one to remind uh, the parties and the court what exactly uh, occupation rent is about. It is designed uh, to do justice to the parties and there is a high level of discretion but it must be referenced to section 12 uh, to 15 of Talata and again section 15 has the factors that the court are, uh, 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 to consider when determining any orders being sought under section 14. Um, those are the intention of the trust, the, of the parties, the purpose of the trust, uh, the welfare of any minors and the wishes and circumstances of the beneficiaries. So those factors will be relevant both to an order for sale of the property and an order for compensation uh, pursuant to this occupation rent principle. Um, what courts do not like to do is to determine blame for the relationship. So this this misconception that one party has to prove that the other party ousted them or physically excluded them leads to evidence um, about uh, things like violence, abuse, those kinds of things where one party says, well, I was forced to move out because of uh, the abuse I was suffering. Again, courts do not like to go down that road. Um, it is a, a fairly low threshold. And um, a recent case of Roland and Blades from 2021, it's, a, it's an incredibly useful judgment um, for, for a variety of factors, not just the occupation rent. Uh, it was a holiday home. Um, both parties had their own property. They weren't married. And this was intended to be a B&B, &B, a, a venture for them both. And um, they split up very shortly after they purchased it. 
it was in joint names, but the um, there wasn't a declaration of trust. And the judgment at paragraph 145, um, very interesting on beneficial interest, because Stack and Dowden again referred to, and the judgment was that a number of factors from Stack and Dowden would have pointed in the opposite direction. But the court found that the cumulative weight of the joint ownership property form, which was sent to the parties, but not um, there was no declaration within it, but that was signed to the parties. It was explained to them as to um, holding the property as joint tenants. There was then an email from Dr. Rowland uh, about that, accepting the position. There was then an attendance note from the solicitor. And so the conclusion was that despite there being no declaration, um, all of the, the, the contemporaneous evidence at the time from emails and attendance notes and letters and so on pointed to the fact that the parties had intended to, to own it jointly. And the oddity about that was that um, both parties kept their own finances. Um, Dr. Rollins put in all of the money. Uh, he financed uh, this property. And in fact, having split up very shortly afterwards, um, Ms. Blades had done very little uh, and she walked away with 50 percent of the beneficial interests. And so um, it, it is useful because it does uh, talk back to Stack and Dowden and um, the fact that uh, in law context is everything. So that's just a useful one if one is looking again at joint name cases and common intention is to look at what kind of evidence the court um, are going to be reliant upon. The second issue, the first issue being the beneficial interest, took up a huge amount of the court time and the property was worth about two million pounds. So it was it was a, uh, that part of it was certainly the largest chunk. The second part, which which is useful here, is the occupation rent, because what happened was for nine years, Miss Blades actually took occupation of the holiday home and um, the, the couple fell out in, in rather um, unfortunate circumstances in that uh, Dr. Blades found a new partner. And sorry, Dr. Rowlands found a new partner and Miss Blades uh, made clear to him that the new partner would not be welcome in the holiday home at any time. Uh, Dr. Rowlands wanted to come and spend some weekends there. And Miss Blades said that he was more than um, welcome to do so uh, with arrangement and that the new partner, however, would never be welcome. And what the court said was, in effect, in effect that was um, excluding her, um, excluding him unreasonably. So the restriction which she put upon his right to occupy was unreasonable. And uh, section 13, well, 12 and 13 of Talata deal with that in order to, to succeed in a claim for compensation mm -hmm. under the statutory provision, one must um, prove that the trustee, uh, Ms. Blades, in this situation had unreasonably excluded or restricted uh, Dr. Rowland's right to occupy the property and um, excluding his new partner um, was sufficient to uh, for the principle of occupation rent to bite. Mm -hmm. The quantification mm -hmm. of it was um, hotly debated. Uh, Dr. Rowland's was our arguing for some £300,000 on daily rates based on booking.com for such a property. And uh, Miss Blades was arguing for a much lower daily rate only at weekends, and her figure was £36,000. There was expert evidence on quantification, and in the end the court said that really Dr Rowland only wanted to use it at weekends. And so they awarded a daily rate of, well, it worked out at about £60,000 over nine years. There's also an interesting costs point on this case as well, because obviously um, Dr. Rowlands had succeeded on his occupation rent, but lost on the beneficial interest points. And um, given the relative values of those two claims, the court allowed Miss Blades 90 percent of her costs. So, again, a useful one if you're looking or, or advising clients about what costs positions are likely to be when they're in it, uh, when there are numerous issues. The uh, other compensation, equitable accounting is the mortgage and improvements to property. Now, mortgage payments, uh, capital will be shared. And so if one party is making capital repayments and reducing the mortgage, obviously that will be shared under the costs of sale. Um, interest payments, depending on how big they are, um, may sometimes be offset about against occupation rent. And again, there are various ways to value occupation rent. So you, you, you most... I would say most advised to get an expert report if you can. If money doesn't allow for that, then uh, um, research on things like 
um, Zoopla, Booking.com, those types of websites can still be used in court. Um, expert evidence is preferred. But obviously, you can also argue that your client, if the one excluded or restricted from the property, has spent money on rental elsewhere, and that can also be used um, as a quantification. It really is about doing justice to the parties, and so the courts are willing to be flexible about the type of evidence they hear. In relation to um, interest, again, interest can come out of the pot, uh, depending upon justice being done and what the two parties have um, spent on general outgoings of the property. So it is, it is a balancing up exercise. Interestingly, in um, Roland and Blades, uh, we had there uh, another argument that didn't take up much of the court time, but I think there was a lot of evidence about how much money had been spent over the nine years on uh, general uh, running costs and maintenance. And um, Dr. Rowland had spent some £240,000 and uh, Ms. Blades had spent £100,000. Now, while those figures were disagreed, I think, in essence, the court accepted at least £100,000 from Ms. Blades and around two hundred and forty from Dr. Rowland. So that was the finding of fact. And yet they didn't make any adjustment for that. So they said that both parties had spent a reasonable amount on, on what they could afford and what was their responsibility and, and no adjustment was made. So, so Dr. Rollers obviously um, probably felt quite aggrieved about that, especially given uh, the occupation rent being as low as it was. In relation to works done on the property, I've indicated there that uh, contribution to works that are done voluntarily and unilaterally um, will not be reimbursed. And that is when someone decides to try and um, put in a new kitchen or do some work and, and show receipts and so on and try and get those things uh, halved. But it has to be improvements to the property or necessary uh, maintenance works. And if you can establish that you have improved the property and increased the value, you still only get the lesser of the money that you've spent or the increase in value of the property. Interestingly, in Ralph and Ralph, um, there was no increase in value evidenced. And despite him being able to evidence the payments made and the works done, the court declined to make any award. And so just a reminder that these things are discretionary and it does um, the, the doing justice to the parties does provide a wide discretion upon judges. And I would advise um, never really advising clients of any of these uh, claims being a sure thing. And likewise, uh, when going into mediation and looking at settling, these are things that one has to consider conceding because um, the uncertainty with which different judges um, apply their discretion it is very difficult. And as long as they refer back to uh, sections 12 to 15, and give proper reasons, it, it really is almost impossible um, to appeal. So I would, I, I have cited the two cases um, earlier on in the slides, but please do um, have a read of them. Ralph and Ralph is a short one, um, and Rollins and Blades is long, but it does deal with, with a lot of really interesting issues that would be a good, um, certainly are going to appear in lots of skeleton arguments in the, in the years that follow. Um, that's the end of my talk. Um, I, I realise it's been rather uh, whirlwind and I hope it's covered the issues that I have been asked about recently. Please do feel free to email me any questions. We're not going to do the live chat just because of the time restriction. And I know um, everyone really has uh, other things to do, but both Hannah and myself are uh, happy to take questions. If you want to email them through, certainly go by the clerks if that's easier. We're going to pass on to Hannah now. Thanks very much, Rowan, um, and, and hello to everybody and welcome. Um, thank you for attending and for sticking with us. Um, what I'm going to do is just pick up on some of the themes that um, have been brought out by Rowan's talk and also address the, the, some a couple of other of the most recent cases um, which, which are useful to those in practice. Um, I, I should say at the beginning that I, I do a lot of Schedule 1 cases, although I, this talk is not about Schedule 1. Um, as many of you, you know, Talata applications often come hand in hand with a cross application under Schedule 1. Um, but if, if the there's quite limited case law on that um, but if if um, if anybody has any questions about that then I'm very happy to to take those by email um, so essentially at, at the outset the the, the themes um, that 
come out of the most recent cases, which I'd like to talk about, and also um, older cases indeed, are, are quite easy to discern. Um, there, there is, first of all, this the issue of the TR1 and the, and the real importance of, of box t the, the, the um, famous box 10 on the TR1. It's absolutely right that, that um, Rowan has already mentioned. This is, this is very, very important evidence. It, it can be very difficult to dislodge um, the evidence of, of, of what is on the TR1. Um, and and it's, a, it's always a, a mountain that has to be climbed for any party who wishes um, the court to make any sort of declaration which is different to the terms of the trust that is set out on, on there. Um, it's not impossible, of course, and it's important not to be complacent, but it's always the first place to start. It's very often um, the takes up the vast majority of, of the judgments in these cases. So it's sort of the beginning and, and, and sometimes the end as well. Um, another theme that emerges from a lot of the recent case law is the importance of creditable oral evidence. <laughs> um, and that is the case, especially where, for whatever reason, there's an absence of documentary support for what a party might be saying. Um, in, in one of the cases that I intend to, to, to talk about tonight, there, there was particular criticism made of the disclosure that the party has made. Um, and that's that's a theme that comes up quite frequently in practice. Um, if Essentially, if, if a party is seeking declaratory relief um, where, they, where they don't have very much documentary evidence to suggest a common intention of a, uh, in, in particular terms, then they really need to be um, the source of party who will give creditable oral evidence to the court. Um, another theme which is picked up in lots of the judgments, and, and I hear it a lot from judges um, when they are dealing with these cases, is, is to go back to the the the, the the language of that Lady Hale used in her um, judgment in Stack and Dowden, and Rowan's absolutely right that it, that that judgment we go back to it time and time again, despite its age. Um, she spoke about how when relationships break down and family relationships sour, parties can be inclined to effectively recast history and recast the past in um, self-exculpatory and vengeful terms. Um, th that is a conclusion that comes up in a lot of the reported cases. Um, it's often at the forefront of judges' minds. So um, a, a practice point, I suppose, that emerges is um, keeping that in mind in the preparation of cases um, and when dealing with clients directly. Um, it, the other theme, of course, that's also mentioned um, in Stack and Dowden is this business of each case being very, very fact specific. Um, uh, uh, there, there is, I think, at, um, in, in dealing with the question of common intention, for example, um, after a while you develop a certain instinct um, for it, but it is not um it's not a tick box exercise it's actually an art not a science and each case is very different um the first case that I, i'd like to have a look at is is this case of lyle and fox and bedborough and bedborough um and this is a trustee in bankruptcy case um it's it's worth a read um it's very useful for having a look at the concept of the common intention, um, the common intention, of course, being effectively the bedrock of the constructive trust. You can't have a constructive trust without um, a clear common intention. The best way to establish that is through uh, uh, an express declaration of trust, but it's not the only way. Um, as we know, it can be established through through words, through conduct, um, and and essentially, the practitioner is often faced with this question of, well, you know quite what is it and, and how to spot it. The facts of this case are a little bit unusual. Um, effectively, the 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 party the, the defendants are were a married couple. I believe they still are married. They certainly were married and when this matter came to court. Um, their marriage was such that that the husband was the main earner in the household. Um, he ran a business seemingly not quite as successful as the parties might have liked. They owned a family home on a normal joint 50-50 basis. Um, at some stage in the in the marriage, the, the wife inherited a sum of money from her mother um, and, and she was very anxious to invest that for the benefit of the party's children. Um, but <coughs> in 2008, 
it transpired that the husband's business wasn't doing very well. The wife was asked to, to contribute some funds towards um, the renovation and extension of the property. Um, she, she was quite reluctant to do that um, and she was unhappy about the husband's mismanagement of the party's finances. Now, you you know you if you're if you are a family practitioner you may very well be thinking you know so far so normal um this sounds like quite an average situation um the difference in this case was that in 2008 um the wife apparently gave the husband an ultimatum and she said that if if you don't transfer the whole of your beneficial interest in the family home um she would divorce him and uh, obviously seek financial remedies there was a discussion between them and the wife took some very informal advice from a solicitor who she knew, um, uh, through, uh, effectively a friend of a friend. Um, and, and effectively, the parties then agreed to exactly the proposal that had been made by the wife to the husband. The, the husband said yes, in equity. He said I, I, orally, without anything else, he would transfer um, his beneficial interest to his wife, leaving him with no equitable interest in the property where he was a legal owner, he lived and he continued to pay the mortgage. Um, it was common ground that there was no agreement drawn up, there was no formality um, after this oral agreement. Um, time marched on and in 2012, the husband's business was, was continuing to, to be in trouble. Um, due to unpaid taxes. So the wife was again asked um, to, to come up with some funds to contribute. And again, she didn't want to do this um, for the reasons that had prompted the discussion in 2008. Um, and so at this point in 2012, she demanded that the parties enter into a declaration of trust, um, a written declaration of trust, which they did. Um, Slightly oddly, and this became an important point in, in terms of the, the, the court's analysis, the declaration of trust that the parties entered into was different um, to the terms of their 2008 agreement. Instead of leaving husband with nothing, it left him with 5% of the beneficial interest. So, so having agreed to, to, to zero in 2008, he'd somehow got 5% of it back um, by 2012. So those are the slightly unusual facts of, of, of what was agreed between the husband and wife. The problem for them um, was, was that it was too late because in 2014, HMRC presented a, a petition for bankruptcy against the husband um, in relation to unpaid taxes. So there was just two years between the 2012 declaration and the petition um, but there had been six years since the 2008 agreement. Um, and so you, you you will all easily discern what this was about. The, 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 the issue before the court was um, what was the effect of the 2008 agreement, if any. Um, the, the 2012 declaration was sufficiently proximate to the bankruptcy um, for the um, the, the the disposition to be set aside um, using insolvency law. But the question is, what about this 2008 discussion? Um, what does that mean? Where did it take these parties? Um, <coughs> now, the claimants in this case, who were the, the trustees in bankruptcy, probably unsurprisingly um, ran a case that the, that the family were effectively making this up. There was no evidence apart from the, the witness statements of the husband and wife and the solicitor friend that there'd been any discussion at all. Um, and it was put to the court that this narrative is a sham. Um, really importantly, the court, in fact, did not accept that. The court accepted that largely the discussions in 2008 had taken place as the husband and wife said they had. Um, and the question is, did they have any legal effect? Um, it, it, it's not a huge surprise, I don't think, to anybody to learn that, that the, the court concluded that they didn't have the effect um, that Mr and Mrs Bedborough said they did. 
Um, and so whilst the court accepted that there had been an agreement of sorts, it didn't amount to a common intention. Um, and I suppose this is this is very interesting because it it, it it really underlines this idea that a common intention is 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 a is a is a, a more fulsome thing um, than a, than a very basic um, agreement. Um, the reasons that the judgment gives um, for for this this um, this deficit, I suppose, are, are, are there are three main points. So firstly, there's a, there's a lack of precision in what these parties agreed between themselves. The husband agreed that he would transfer his interest, but not that he was doing so immediately or that he would do so forthwith. Um, and so the court saw that as a lack of precision in terms of what was actually agreed. There was a lack of any formality following the agreement, even though it was clear that both parties knew that they, they ought to have done something um, to put it into practice. So that was another um, deficit that undermined the agreement, making the leap from agreement to common intention. Um, the court also put a lot of store um, against the, uh, in terms of the idea of the, the wife being motivated to keep the marriage together and that in fact what she was doing was taking practical steps um, to avoid marriage breakdown rather than seeking to, to change her legal position and tackle a legal problem. Um, <coughs> effectively, the court said that, that what she wanted and what she ultimately got was the reassurance that the husband would be willing to transfer um, the property to her. Um, but but not that he actually did so. Another significant point was that when the parties did come to formalise matters through the 2012 declaration, they formalised something different. Um, as I've said, husband effectively got 5% of his beneficial interest, notionally got it back. Um, and and, and the, the court really alighted upon that issue um, as, as one that suggested the 2008 agreement in the first place was incomplete. It was incohate um, because clearly there was an acknowledgement there that the parties had not worked through the question of, of how it could be right that, that, Mr., um, that Mr. Bedwell was left with nothing despite his, his ongoing payment of the mortgage. Um, and so all of those ingredients sort of came together um, and, and fell short of common intention. Um, and, and essentially what, what the wife was said to have received from the husband was a reassurance, um, a totally honest reassurance, but it wasn't enough to give rise to this constructive trust that the parties um, wished to effectively have declared by the court. Um, if we could maybe move on to the next slide, Ray, thank you very much. Um, I think that's, um, and, and maybe the next one as well. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, there was an issue around equitable accounting that arose in this case. Um, it, as, is, as is very commonly the case, um, the wife sought an equitable account for the cost of renovations prior to 2008. Um, she had spent, at this point, the majority of her inherited funds on the property. And um, uh, there wasn't a clear common intention that she should get her money back. And Rowan has already referred to the to the case of Wilcox and Tate. Um, like like many litigants before and no doubt after her, she fell foul of that rule. Um, it is very, very difficult to get an equitable account for, for um, expenditure that has taken place inside a relationship um, and, and absent a common intention that a person should be receiving an account for it. Um, and, and I suppose that is why in many cases in practical terms, um, arguments often rage about quite when um, the court will date a, a, the party separation because that is what flows from it. Um, my next case is Roland and Blades, and I don't intend to, to talk about this at great length because Rowan's already dealt with lots of the most important points. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but it, it's, it's another case that's really worth a read. Um, on the question of the TR1 in Roland and Blades, it's actually a bit, there's a bit of a cautionary tale for practitioners um, in this case because the parties signed the, um, the TR1 with no aspect of the box 10 filled out and the, the land registry re 
returned that to the conveyancing solicitors um, and they used their file note to, to fill it in retrospectively without checking with the parties that they agreed to that. Um, the parties complained about it and the court agreed that they shouldn't have done it. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a cautionary tale um, it, in terms of practice points. Um, and one other point just to bring out was that it's it's it is useful. Um, there's a useful discussion in this case on the question of um, what are parties expressed common intent, what are the parties expressed intention versus what they might have in their mind and not express um, in terms of intentions. Because, of course, what Dr. Rowlands uh, uh, tried to advance in this case um, was the idea that a, a sort of incompletely expressed wish on his part had been part of the party's common intention. Um, but actually, when looking at words and conduct to infer common intention, the court is looking at what people have said and what they have done and what the other party could reasonably be expected to have understood as well. Um, so I think that's another um, interesting and, and important feature of that case. It's really, really worth a read. Um, and I, I, I do uh, I recommend it effectively. Um, but I'm, I think we'll move on to the next case. Um, because Rowan has already covered this in quite a lot of detail. Um, and, and the next one on, on the slides is um, a, a really interesting case of Armin, um, which was in front of Lord Justice Nuji um, last year in 2020. Um, now, this concerned a, a family home in North London, um, which was registered in the sole name of the um, mother of a, of a family. Um, she started out as the claimant um, seeking possession of the property. The property was occupied by a, a, um, her estranged husband, who did in fact die in the course of proceedings, and also um, the party's sons. They all lived in the property, which was registered in her sole name, um, while the, the, the claimant wife, claimant mother, um, however you want to refer to her, um, and, and the daughters of the family lived elsewhere. Um, so, so she sought possession of the property on the basis that she was the sole legal owner. Um, and the defendants counterclaimed um, seeking declaratory relief that they that she was a bear trustee and, and that they owned the entire beneficial interest in the property. Now, um, essentially, what happened was that at first instance, mother failed. Um, her, her application to for possession was dismissed um, and the counterclaim for um, declaratory relief was successful um, and she was left with nothing. She was left with no beneficial interest in this property, which was um, in her name. She then appealed um, a slightly unusual appeal for various reasons, but she appealed and she failed on appeal. Um, and essentially um, the, the, the appellate court supported the original decision. Um, it is a useful case um, because it is a an example of a sole name case. Um, and of course, the sole, names case, sole name cases are the most difficult cases to be successful on if you are um, acting for a party asserting a beneficial interest where they don't have any legal interest sitting behind that. Um, and sometimes it can feel like climbing a bit of a mountain, but this is a case where um, those parties were in fact successful. Um, it's clear from the appeal decision that the mother's um, evidence at first instance was very poor indeed and, and, and um, the court rejected her, her evidence in, in many respects. Um, very unusually, um, she, she chose to, to appeal but without seeking a transcript, um, which of course caused a lot of difficulties. <clears throat> in terms of being able to point to why the judge's reasoning was wrong um, when there was no transcript of the evidence. Um, clearly, she made a very poor witness. She wasn't believed. And this goes back to the, the theme that I picked up on at the beginning about having creditable oral evidence. Um, for example, she asserted that there had been oral discussions. And of course, had she been successful, oral discussions can um, 
can provide effectively the common intention that's needed for a, a constructive trust. But in this case, um, the other parties said that the oral discussions had not taken place. She didn't have any um, corroborative evidence of what she was saying. Um, and, and because she wasn't believed, essentially, she was unable to get over the first hurdle of, of, of there being a common intention um, understood between the relevant parties. She was also unable to show any detriment. Um, but of course, essentially, because she'd failed in terms of common intention, she was certainly unable to, um, to, to she couldn't go any further, essentially. Um, in these cases, it, it is absolutely essential to get common intention um, clearly established in some way or another. Um, the 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 a practice point that emerges from this this case, and it's it's quite long, but it's worth reading. Um, a practice point that really emerges from it is the importance of considering at an early stage and in the pleadings the idea of running a, a alternative cases, pleading cases with an alternative option. Both of the parties, um, so that the 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 claimant mother and the defendant. Um, husband and sons, they ran all or nothing cases. Um, neither of them suggested um, any sort of compromise or halfway house position. Um, and and it's, it, the, the implication in the judgment is that if the wife had done that, she might have been, th th there's a possibility of her being successful. But in fact, because both parties ran an all or nothing case, in which they said that the beneficial interest in the property was entirely theirs. Um, the, the court ultimately left um, this this claimant with, with nothing at all. Um, and it's been it's been commented on that that outcome is very harsh to her. Um, but but it is the result of the way in which the 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 case was pleaded, essentially um, on 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 both sides. Um, <clears throat> if we could move on to the next slide. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, another case which is recent and interesting um, and, and in fact contains a, a blend of, of, of joint name and sole name analysis is the case of Maya. Um, this is a High Court case from last year. Um, there are some similarities to the case of Armin. It, it concerns very complex family arrangements around a portfolio of properties. Um, so a family owning a whole series of properties um, and, and some of which are dwellings for family and some of which are, are used as commercial properties and, and rented out um, and, and, and also a situation where the ownership of these properties is repeatedly effectively exchanged um, between various family members and numerous parties have become involved in uh, at the point of acquisition in order to um, facilitate acquisition by being named on mortgages. Um, the, the, the facts of the case um, and, and, and those family arrangements, of course, are frequently not accompanied by um, written declarations, by written agreements. In the end, in this case, it's it's worth remembering at the outset that where there was a a, a TR1 declaration, that was followed. Um, but it, in any case, um, that the facts were that the, the claimants, that all of the litigants were brothers. Um, the claimants were a group of, of four brothers, and the defendant was their uh, their fifth brother. Um, and it was common ground in this case that the family had traditionally owned a, a number of properties. It was common ground that the defendant had effectively run these properties um, for the benefit of the family up until a particular point. Um, he had dealt with the collection of rents and so on. There were a number of different groups of properties which the court um, dealt with. There was a group of jointly owned properties um, in, in, in all of the brothers' names. And there was a group of properties which were in the sole name of the defendant. And the court dealt with those as well. So again, this is a useful judgment because um, it, it's, it's interesting to see the sole name case analysis alongside the joint name case analysis. Um, the, the 
claimants sought um, that they had beneficial interests um, in all of the jointly owned properties, um, which was the legal position in any case. And they also sought that they had beneficial interests um, amounting to what they had contributed in properties in the sole name of the defendant. Um, this is a case which the defendant, he very much lost this case. Um, and again, it, the court found him to be an extremely unreliable witness and essentially um, disbelieved him on, on almost every point where there was any other evidence um, which, which went against what he said. Um, the court made a lot of um, remarks about his disclosure. His disclosure was palpably poor. Um, and, and, and there's a reminder in this judgment about the importance of disclosure and the importance of dis if, if a docu do documents are disclosable, um, whether or not they damage a party's case. Um, and, and that is a really important point to bear in mind. Um, the defendant had signed written agreements <coughs> to the effect that the jointly owned properties were in fact jointly owned and, and not solely owned by him. Um, and he sought to say at the trial that the effectively his signature on, on these documents was meaningless um, because he'd only done it to, to please his elderly mother. Um, and, and the court rejected this and it goes back to this issue which comes out of Roland and Blades. Um, it, 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 if a party has an unexpressed view um, or opinion in their mind, then that will not be enough to exculpate them from a common intention where the other parties involved would 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 reasonably have understood what that common intention um, was. Um, and so he very much lost on, on, on that basis. Um, in terms of the properties that were in the defendant's sole name, so the sole name side of the case, um, the court looked extremely critically at his evidence about how these properties had been financed. Most of these properties were commercial properties. They were rented out um, by him. And there was clear evidence that he could not have financed them in the way that he said he had. Um, his evidence was essentially um, very, very poor on this basis. And, and so what the conclusion that the court came to was essentially quite a traditional resulting trust conclusion, um, whereby the beneficial interest was quantified by reference to, to what these parties had contributed. Um, it's a really, uh, it's a really, really interesting case and a, a very salutary lesson, really. Um, I think that brings me to the end of, I think that's the final slide. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, they're very, very welcome to email um, either Rowan or I. Um, I'm, as, as many of you know, I'm slightly more a family practitioner who does Talata and Rowan is the real um, civil expert. Um, but, but you know, lots of the same cases, lots of the same issues come up um, in, in family and non-family disputes. Um, but we're very happy to take any questions that people may have by email. Um, have you, have, is there anything to add, Rowan? Uh, no, thanks, Hannah. That's really useful. I think that's true that um, if you're not sure, uh, please just inquire with the clerks and they'll direct you to, to which of us is probably more suited. So please do let us know if there's anything that's arisen on any of the cases as well, or if you want a copy of the judgments, please just let us know. Thank you all. We'll finish there. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening.